you all. And uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Ray Riddell. I'm the president of the St. John Naturalist Club. And um, <clears throat> as you all know, we, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Wollastook, uh, whose ancestors, uh, along with the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy tribes, uh, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. It's a beautiful morning out there. I'm looking forward to this uh, presentation. It's the final presentation for our, our winter season and I told Anthony we're saving the best to last. Uh, we'll be starting up again in September. Uh, we have a, uh, an array of very interesting speakers lined up for you all the way up uh, to uh, January. Uh, so please join us uh, then. Um, and we'll continue actually to run these meetings um, on Zoom uh, for the foreseeable future. As you all know, the museum is, uh, is closing down. We do not have access uh, to uh, that theater anymore. So uh, I wish to say that if any of you are not familiar with Zoom or need to hone your skills, let us know. Uh, and we'll set up a workshop uh, online and we'll go through the uh, app with you and some of its features if, if you need that. Okay, the, the good weather has um, allowed us to finally get back to what we uh, enjoy, which is getting out and about. And I wanna thank Suzanne Bonnell for uh, leading two successful outings, uh, Chuck and Jeanette for leading a wellness walk and a Hank Scarth for his uh, early morning birding trip. All were well attended and uh, we saw some new faces. So um, excellent, That's, uh, most excellent. Uh, there's several more outings are planned in May and June and details are on the Facebook page and on our new and improved website. Uh, Patty McCarroll, our webmaster, has been working with Julie Bauer uh, to give us a new and improved look. So check that out. The outings and the presentations uh, are the work of our program committee led by Mary Solos, who you'll see a little later in, um, in the broadcast. Our most recent workshop um, was on iNaturalist, uh, Avenza, and eBird. And in, in a word, it was awesome. Uh, we got to use the apps in a new nature uh, trust reserve in Grand Bay under the guidance of experts like Brittany Dixon and her team of uh, three uh, really knowledgeable people. Uh, I should note that some clubs charge up to $60 a person for this workshop, but this club, St. John Naturalist Club, continues to provide high quality sessions like this at no cost other than donations. So please let us know. If you have any suggestions on uh, outings uh, you'd like to see uh, us plan and any topics of interest uh, for um, uh, you know next spring. Our bulletin, um, quick uh, uh, kudos to Charles Graves. Our bulletin goes out every two months and Charles produced the last one, which uh, is just exceptional. Uh, Jan Riddell and Julie uh, assisted with editing. It features an article by one of the founding members of the club, Jane Tarn, who founded it 60 years ago. Uh, the bulletin also contains all our contact details and trip details. So if you did not get one, if you do not get one, uh, just contact us, we'll send you a copy. As, as you all know, um, many of our outings registration is optional. And registering just means that you get notified if the event is canceled but you can show up without registering. There are um, a couple of exceptions though. If you see that the seats or numbers are limited, then registration guarantees you a place. If you decide not to attend, that place remains empty. So please, if you see limited and you decide not to attend, let us know and we can let someone else on the waiting list take that seat. For instance, this Warbler workshop next Friday, as a limited number, so registration is is quite important uh, if you wish to have a make a have a have a spot there. Microplastics. We'd be um, having a, um, a presentation on microplastics in the fall, and uh, ACAP uh, is providing um, households uh, free of charge with a filter that collects microfibers that shed off your clothes during the washing cycle. Um, 
If you wish to participate in uh, citizen science and contribute to the project, then uh, you know let ACAP know. Uh, Julie will post something on the on the chat or contact ACAP directly. Uh, the, the filters are free. Uh, they will also provide you with a kitchen scale. And uh, all you have to do is to clean the filter every two to three weeks and uh, report the details to them. Interesting project uh, where you can be a citizen science and, uh, and clean the microplastics from um, the wastewater. Also, milkweed, um, Nature New Brunswick will be conducting a survey on milkweed seeds. And uh, you may know uh, from our past um, uh, conversations that Jim Wilson, Janet Kempster, and his team provided uh, 3,200 packets of milkweed seeds to be distributed around the province as part of our Monarch tagging program. And the survey asks about where your seeds were planted, how you made out, uh, what kind of results. A uh, link to the survey is uh, in our chat box. And uh, Julie will be sending out, uh, sending a link to all the members. So watch out for that in the, uh, in the future. The, um, just wanna mention the Festival of Nature is uh, coming up in uh, June. Um, I wholly recommend it. It's um, a good chance to visit biodiversity uh, in the um, in the Fredericton area and meet local club members. Uh, some of our members, uh, Jim Wilson, Don McPhail, are leading trips. So um, if you if you still uh, are interested, uh, trips are available. But get on there now because um, it's open to the public and um, and seats are going fast. Um, our sign for Green Law is uh, nearing completion. We have funds from uh, Hawkwatch of North America, and uh, Julie has been designing the sign in conjunction with Hank and uh, Todd Watts and uh, members of the PLBO committee. Uh, also mentioned every time here, the Wildlife Trust Fund, how positive it is providing uh, money for uh, our projects and projects around the province. And you can donate, uh, volunteer, or um, most importantly, buy a conservation plate. Uh, Jim Wilson uh, made a presentation on our behalf, on the club's behalf, um, for uh, a license application for the Point Le Pro uh, Bird Observatory. And uh, every, um, uh, every intervener had something to say about whether they should be granted a license for 25 years. Uh, Jim made a 10 minute presentation, a lot of work on his behalf. Uh, but the um, most exciting news I have for um, all our members is um, a new development uh, uh, that the club has now partnered with uh, Nature New Brunswick and uh, their executive director, Vanessa Roy McDougall up there uh, to fund a project coordinator for the club. Now in the past, I've told you that we have had uh, some funding uh, for individual projects like Point La Pro and some you know, minor um, funding for green law, but now we've uh, entered into a partnership with um, Nature New Brunswick, and uh, Julie has now become an employee of Nature New Brunswick, but providing uh, services to our club, and so she'll be handling all of our um, uh, projects, uh, providing full-time support to Point La Pro, to uh, Green Law, uh, to arranging our outings. Um, arranging our presentations uh, and um, looking after a project at Irving Nature Park. And a little footnote on that, we did receive uh, $15,000 from the Environmental Trust Fund to uh, uh, augment that program. So we're looking forward to ramping that program up and looking for volunteers uh, to walk the beach, which is not a difficult thing to do, uh, and uh, spot the birds. We're also reaching out uh, and having uh, education uh, workshops. Um, we're also, uh, Julie is looking after communications. Uh, so this is a first for the club. Uh, for the last 60 years, we've been operating totally with uh, volunteers. It's been volunteer driven. Uh, so now this gives us um, a person that is fully committed to supporting uh, the volunteers and, 
And so I think our volunteer commitments, uh, responsibilities will be um, diminished. And, uh, and I think uh, we'll encourage more volunteers to step up. The uh, next big event uh, for the club will be the annual general meeting, which is scheduled for uh, June 15th. And that'll be on Zoom again, so that we can reach more people. Uh, full reports will be set out in advance and, um, and elections will take place for all the committee uh, positions and the executive. Now the nominating committee has names for all positions except the secretary. So if you wish to volunteer, let me know. Uh, with the project coordinator in place to deal with minutes, etc., the role of the secretary will be advisory and an opportunity to participate in club decisions. The term is one year. So let me know if you are interested. Finally, following the presentation by Anthony today, uh, I would ask all members to remain online to, to uh, vote uh, on one item of business that we need to deal with. Uh, Don McPhail will give a short uh, report on Greenlaw Mountain Hawkwatch project and he'll present the budget, uh, which needs approval from the members. So stay tuned. Uh, and re reminder, only members can vote on those motions and uh, approve this particular budget. So. Uh, that's it for me. So now over to uh, Mary Solos. Mary. Thank you, Ray. And uh, just before we get started, um, I'd like to thank Jim Russell for, um, for suggesting today's guest speaker and for making contact with him and for Julie uh, Bauer for following up on that. Um, I also just want to go back to one thing that Ray mentioned. Um, although you know that the Market Square building uh, location for the New Brunswick Museum is closed, I just want to assure everybody that the New Brunswick Museum is fully operational um, as far as our research and collections that we're busier than ever now packing up uh, to uh, to, uh, to prepare for a new accommodation. So hopefully we'll hear more about that in the future. And again, just a thanks to all the volunteers, including those from the St. John Naturalist Club who spend many hours uh, at the New Brunswick Museum helping out, especially in the natural history department. So with that, I am now delighted to introduce today's guest speaker, Anthony Bardwell. Anthony is a member of Sidonskis, sorry, Sidonsisk, or St. Mary's First Nation, and has been studying plants and fungi for over a decade. Uh, he's also been studying insects for the last several years, and uh, uh, which is very interesting. He was mentioning that he's not just studying the beautiful insects that we uh, first think of, like butterflies, but he's also getting into uh, some other groups of insects. So that should be very interesting. Anthony currently works at Fredericton Botanical Gardens and is also involved in his family's two businesses which operate out of Fredericton. Wabanaki Tree Spirit Tours and Events organizes walks, workshops and events to inform and educate the public about Indigenous cultures here in New Brunswick. And Soul Flower Herbals is a body care business where Anthony and his family make soap, moisturizers, lip balms, and other things that are infused with extracts from the forest and surrounding areas. So today, Anthony is going to talk to us uh, about how some of the local plants and fungi are currently used and some of the history of their use from the two-eyed seeing perspective. So I'm really intrigued and anxious to learn more about this view and about Anthony's topic. And uh, I'd like to remind the audience to type your questions into the chat for Anthony and he'll answer those at the end of the presentation. And so right now, I, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Anthony and I will uh, let you take over the mic and the camera from here, Anthony. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, so yeah, my name's Anthony. Um, I guess to get started, you should probably know a little bit about me. Um, I've been, I guess, I, I've been using like plant products and like, I don't know, tinctures and different things like that pretty much my whole life. Um, 
I remember growing up and like just stopping on the side of the road with my mom and we just like get out of the car and she cut a bunch of elderberries in like a little field and we get back in the car and go home and she pluck them all and end up making syrup or wine or something out of it some some sort of thing but I mean that's just one example and uh but funny enough I didn't really get into plants or like I guess going out and foraging things until I moved to Canada I grew up in Tennessee um so in 2006 after I graduated from high school we moved up here I tried to go to university for a little while and didn't really find it was uh for me so I I stopped doing that, and that following summer, I took Jim, or uh, what's his name, Gart Bishop's uh, plant course at UMB, and uh, I ended up getting a job out of that course, funny enough, doing wetland delineation, and um, apparently, I guess I had an eye for plants, and uh, was really interested in sedges and grasses and things when I was in that course. Uh, not so much anymore. They're, they're pretty difficult and time consuming to identify. Um, so I did that for a while. I did the wetland delineation thing. And then I got into mushrooms probably around that time when I was out doing that, identifying plants and digging soil pits and stuff like that. I would see mushrooms on the ground, of course, and I just, I was curious. So I started picking them up and bringing them home. Just like big bags, like, not big bags, I guess, like a lunch bag full of random unidentified mushrooms. It's pretty dangerous. Uh, so I would bring those home and try to identify them with literally one, one book, the Audubon Society's Mycological, or yeah, Audubon Society's mushroom book there. And it, it was already out of date. It's even more out of date now. Pictures are <laughs> subpar. Descriptions were really bad. So yeah, I didn't get very far with that. And then, I don't know, I did, I did that for a while. We did like some really cool projects. We did one at, there's a, a land trust that was entrusted to the Willistically people and uh, entrusted to St. Mary's First Nations, Don here, and uh, for us to sort of steward. And uh, it was donated by a prof from UMB here, um, Bill Cummings, and him and his wife left to BC and left it to us. So we did a, a small, well, not small, it was actually quite a project where we went out and instead of doing a um, assessment based on timber value, we did an assessment based on culturally significant plant species. So we marked it all out based on different stand types, just from like uh, GIS and stuff. And then we went in on foot and did transects throughout all of it. And Found all kinds of really cool stuff. It was a lot of fun. Um, but now it's, we're, uh, we're starting to get back to like using that land. It hasn't really been used much since that survey was done. So hopefully here in the next few years, we start doing things there and having events and stuff. And we can have other people come up and we can show them the land because there's a lot to see up. And it's got, uh, two sides. One is by the river. It's, it's a smaller side. It's it's about a 200 acre, I think, 200 acres or something like that. It, it, it's a good chunk of land. Uh, but it's, there's some really nice spots of like uh, beach, like American beach that are almost clean. They look really nice, just full stands of them. There's a couple of them on sort of the north end of the, the property there. And uh, yeah, so after all that, after I got done doing wetland delineation, I sort of just went on my own for a little while and I started looking at mushrooms all over the place. I would just walk down our trail down behind my house and bring stuff back and like harvest some spruce tips sometimes in the, fall, in the spring. And then, uh, I don't know, there's all kinds of things we harvest throughout the seasons. Um, 
I guess everyone knows fiddleheads, um, but also around this time of year when you're out looking for fiddleheads, there's like nettles. Uh, those are a great spring green. Um, goldenrod's one that we would get a lot. Uh, around here, I don't think many people think of eating goldenrod greens as a very common thing. Um, but if you just sort of take one off and brush it and smell it, it has like a very spicy smell. Um, my grandma, so another thing about me, I guess, my grandma's Korean, so I'm, well, I'm mixed, I'm of mixed indigenous heritage because in Korea, they're, they're indigenous to that little peninsula. So uh, my grandma would always make what we call muchum, it's just mixed greens, usually some kind of blanched, <laughs> whatever's green, I guess, whatever's up doesn't really matter to her too much. She would do all kinds of different things, but goldenrod was uh, one of the ones she liked the most. So after she blanched it, she would just like drench it in sesame seed oil and throw some sesame seeds on it and some salt and MSG and stuff. It was really good. So we do that still. It's, it's one of our spring harvests. Um, yeah, so after all that, I went to Parks Canada for three or four years and worked in Fundy National Park, teaching, well, doing interpretive guides, I did, uh, all kinds of stuff there. I mean, <laughs> the list is, it's pretty good, I guess. I don't know. They even had me like doing little kitchen parties, acting and stuff, which is not, not me at all. Um, but I stopped working there because I just felt, I don't know, like I was away from home. I have a son, he's uh, 12 now. And so I moved on from that because, not, not because the job was bad or anything, I loved it in Fundy. I, was, I, could, I would go back and live there. I don't know if I didn't have my family. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so me and my mom had this sort of, I don't know, epiphany. My grandmother was passing away at the time and we were just like, hey, let's start this business because I mean, I was already doing these sort of walks in Fundy or Parks Canada, but I don't know. I felt like I wasn't really reaching the audience that I wanted to reach. And I mean, yeah, I reached out to a lot of people and it definitely spread far and wide because people that come to Fundy come from everywhere. Um, but it, it just didn't feel, I don't know, as wholesome as it is, it does now. Like, uh, so I came back and we started this business. Two, I guess this is our third year now. Yeah. So we're going on our third year and it's, it's been pretty rough, I guess it's, a, it was a rough start with COVID and everything. Um, as I'm sure everyone else is aware of it's crazy out there right now, um, especially a couple of years ago when it first started. Uh, so I guess I can jump into the slides that I have because that sort of catches you up to like, I don't know, sort of who I am in a way, but um, through us starting our business, uh, we were getting all kinds of requests. The, si the city of Fredericton wanted us to do like these Chinese bus tours, which like I'm not about. I did plenty of those in Fundy and like, it's just the wrong crowd for me. And the groups are too large. It's devastating to like try to like walk with 60 people through like a small trail somewhere without damaging anything. Like, I, I don't know. I'm sure you guys have experience with that. Uh, it can be, it can be hard. So we, we try to limit our groups down to like no more than 20. We can push it to 30 if it's like a nice open area or something, but like we like doing smaller groups and I don't know, focusing on people who are interested on it, in it, right? Because uh, I don't know, some people show up and it's not really what they expect. We, we, we have a lot of stories and things that we tell. Um, it's, it's not solely like 
we go out and we're foraging something. Most of the time we go out and we don't forage anything on our walks just because we don't want to disrupt what's there, right? And uh, we might like show people what it is and give them sources, like resources to like go sort of learn for themselves. So that way when they go out somewhere else, they can hopefully uh, be able to identify it or something. So we do have like, some teaching aspects in it when it comes to identification, especially for the plants, not so much the mushrooms. I try not to, uh, I don't know. It's not that I don't want people to get into mushrooms. I, I really, really do, but it's, when it's not the focus of something, you, it's, it's hard to, uh, I don't know. They're, they're, they can just be really tricky. <laughs> I'm sure, uh, there's plenty of people who can attest to that. Um, so after doing the walks for a year, we got a email from one of the board members of the Botanical Garden here in Fredericton. It's right there at Odell. And they had heard, of course, heard about it because they heard, you know, we were doing walks in Odell and they're right there next door. So uh, one of them reached out to us and they were like, did you want to put in a garden or something? And funny enough, me and my mom had been talking about how Odell Park's amazing. It's such a great little old growth forest in the middle of a city, like 400 plus years old, some of the trees, I think. So just think about how, how much they've seen in those 400 years, right? Um, so they contacted us, but me and my mom were like, well, we, we, get, we can show people a lot of plants in Odell Park. There's a lot. Like we can walk for hours and talk and, you know, there's always something to see there. Um, but there's things that don't grow there, like at all. It's the wrong habitat. It won't grow there. <laughs> and um, so it was kind of funny that they came to us and we were like, well, yeah, that'd be, that'd actually be really cool. And then so we partnered up with them. Uh, so it was the fall before last. Me and uh, Jim Goltz, who's a very, very amazing botanist, and veterinarian, and <laughs> amongst other things, birder. Um, he is a, I, I didn't know at the time, but he, and he continues to be, he's a volunteer there at the Botanical Gardens. And I got the, the pleasure of going around with him and collecting a lot of the plants for the site. So I'm gonna share my screen now so you can sort of see. And so this is sort of like the main center of the site. And so this is the Wabanagi Healing Garden. If you look at the shape, it's in the shape of a medicine wheel. And um, that, that of course has a significance. There's all kinds of things I could say about the medicine wheel, but I'm gonna talk more about, um, I guess what we put in it and how I chose these different things. Oh, maybe I just thought of something. I might want to switch back and forth between something. That's fine. I can do that. Um, so when we decided this spot, like uh, this wasn't all like this, this was just like a fieldy area. There wasn't crushed rock here and stuff already. And uh, so we pretty much just walked up the hill and it, well, it wasn't far from the resource center. This is like right next to the resource center at the Botanical Gardens. Um, and it, it just so happened it had a lot of things already there that uh, are kind of significant in a way. I mean, they're all significant. So I mean, like that, that word is so relative, right? Because all, all these plants and all these things, the rocks, the dirt, the air, it's, it's all significant. 
Um, but the ones that we chose were uh, ones that I just pretty much sourced out of the, the flora of New Brunswick. Hal Hines did a great job of uh, including, I don't know, 50 or so species of plant that have Mi'kmaq or Maliseet words. I think there might be even more in there. Um, so initially we weren't sure the size of the plot that we were going to do, um, but sort of in the back over here on the right, there's a bunch of red oser dogwood uh, already there. It was already planted. There's pussy willows and things in there. Uh, and then across the back over here, there's a little seep. It's like a little wetland spot. And there was like red-tipped willow, I think, already in there. Uh, Salix aerocephala. Um, so a couple key ones. And then sort of off the screen to the right, like if you were to pan the camera to the right, there's a stand, like a little mini stand of cedar. Uh, that has quite a few birds nesting in it all the time and uh, there's spruce around and fir around, so tree species. But we did not initially include the tree species. We weren't sure the space we were gonna have. Um, I don't even think we had uh, cherry or anything. Like, we, we have cherry planted there now, some uh, pin cherry and I think black cherry. And, uh, but yeah, so, we started out with the ring, and uh, so we said, okay, we want sweet grass and tobacco. So here's a, a good comparison of what sweet grass is on the right. And then actually up front here is uh, plantain on the left. So I can talk a little bit about these two. And I should say too, I guess, um, I'm not a, I don't know my, my native tongue. Like I don't know Maliseet, I don't know Mi'kmaq. I know some words. Um, but unfortunately, like, it's just, I didn't grow up around here and I haven't had a chance really until recently. I've been thinking about it more to get, go take a class because they've been teaching classes here at St. Mary's, like, I think every summer. So, you know, I hope they have to go sign up for it, but it's, it's a very intense class where you're not allowed to speak English or it's like French immersion, but with Maliseet. And uh, it sounds really cool, but you pretty much spend the whole day in class. It's an all day class, every day, all summer for two years. And then you sort of know what you're talking about. I, or I think you can speak a little bit at least by the end of it. Um, so I, I don't know all the, the words in my own language right off. I know some of the Latin, but of course I can't, I can't memorize everything. I try to memorize as much as I can. Um, so we got sweet grass, which of course is one of our main ones that we use for smudging. Um, we'll make braids out of this, but it doesn't grow really in Fredericton anywhere. There might be like a couple spots like ditches and random areas, like little wet areas that might have some, but like it's more of a shoreline species around here. It's experience but um so we just transplanted this from elsewhere in the botanical garden brought it down and it's it's thriving now like i've been taking pictures of it all all spring well our spring's been so weird it's pretty much summer already. and then on the left um we got the tobacco in the back. So um, I guess we can talk about that a little bit. The tobacco is special. It's not the same tobacco that's in cigarettes. This is Nicotiana rustica. It's a, uh, it's an heirloom variety, I guess, if you want to be specific, like really, it's, it's an heirloom species, this, this particular strain. This one was given to my mother, I don't know, before she left her job with the chiefs and started working on the business with me. Like that was what she was doing beforehand. 
and uh, she ended up going to Ganawagi and met some of our family because yes, I'm a I'm a member of Sedan Sisk, but I'm also Mi'kmaq and I'm Mohawk. Funny enough, and uh, so she went there and met some of our relatives, and they gave her some tobacco seeds that are. It's a strain that's been passed down for you know ten thousand years or some something like that. It's been a long, long breeding cycle. <laughs> um, so we've had the pleasure of growing that every year, and we take that to elders and we we grow it and we give it to our ceremony uh, people because me and my mother don't really do ceremony, and like everybody has this sort of image in their head. Oh. All natives, they all they all smudge and they all you know do sweats and they, no, that's not necessarily true. Just like all like India Indians, they don't do yoga, right? Like it's 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 like part of their culture, but it's not something that everyone does. Um, so we grow it. We're we're medicine keepers, and that's that's our specialty. So we don't do ceremony like prayer and stuff. Um, I, I do pray. It's not that I don't pray. It's, uh, I don't know, doing it as like a public offering is, it takes a skill set, right? Just like anything else. And it's just not in our skill set. I mean, we can do it, but it's not really our uh, forte. Um, so we like to provide the resources so that other people can do it. And uh, so we take lots of time out of our year to grow it and cure it and uh, process it and mix it with other things because uh, when we say tobacco, we don't necessarily mean the plant tobacco. Tobacco is, it's, it's a blend or knick is another, another word we use for tobacco. And it's, it's just a blend of herbs essentially. Um, I probably have, I'll, I'll talk more about that one in a bit because we'll, we'll get back to uh, the other plants that are sort of involved in that. Um, and plantain, um, we got three species, I believe, that I know of here. We got the rubles, and then we have the, the white man's footprint or whatever, the, the, the non-native one. Rubles is a native plantain, and they look pretty much identical except for the, uh, the red base middle of the summer, if you look at the, the base of the plantain, the rubles will have a, sort of a pinkish hue at the base, and the European one has its green all the way down. And then there's also the seaside plantain, which is not really in this shot. I don't think I see any, um, but it's sort of just south of the screen there. Um, then we have a row of, uh, these are Jerusalem artichokes, which are not native, but it was one of the ones that we sort of adopted, sort of like, uh, I don't know, I think we knew about the plantain, but the, the sunchokes were one of the ones that if you were to go to like encampment sites along the river, you'll find groundnut and you'll find uh, Jerusalem artichokes because we, we did quite a bit of agriculture, even though you know, we're not really fully known for it. We also planted a lot of corn and beans and squash and things. Even here, we have we have heirloom varieties that have been passed down from all over. Like they just got traded far and wide. Um, so in this picture, you can actually see the cedar up in the back right here. Uh, there's just a little bit of cedar. So. The cedar, the sweet grass, the tobacco, those three, those are three of our sort of sake, like, I don't know, they're, they're a higher tier of sacredness, I guess, in a way, but like, I don't know, I don't like to look at it like that. I just, I don't know, we always put like these labels on things, but it's, it's not really that simple. Um, but, so I guess for like, if you want to bring that back to the medicine wheel, Medicine Wheel has the four directions that it correlates to, and those four directions also have plant species that correlate to them and the seasons. And uh, like, I don't know all those by heart, but 
cedar, tobacco, sweet grass are three of the, the main ones there. Um, this is this picture. Oh, there's a very sad, sad looking beaked hazelnut. So I don't harvest them too often because I don't know, it's a lot of work. They're, uh, the husks on the beaked hazelnuts are like, I don't know, they're like covered in like a fiberglass. They stick into your fingers and like, you really got to wear gloves when you do it. Um, but that's, that's definitely one of our edible food sources that we would have had uh, long, long ago. And um, another thing, I guess, to say about this, the Jerusalem artichokes, like I said, they would be along the river and stuff. Well, again, that's like another good example, I guess, along with the sweet grass. Uh, you wouldn't find any of this in Odell. Right? This would be way out of place. Um, so it's a nice spot, right? We can we 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 incorporate this walk into or this into our walks, and uh, so we walk down through the forest and we come back up, and this is sort of the finisher where we end and back up to the top of the hill. Um, so here, this is sort of the corner in front of the cedar trees that are there. Um, see. We got a bunch of these wild cucumbers climbing on this. Um, now, oh, the uh, wild cucumber is not like regular cucumber. You can't eat it. It's very, very bitter. Um, I don't know. I don't really know of any uses, but we did. I think we had a name for it, and that's why it's here in the garden. So not everything. I mean, that, that, that's the problem with the language barrier and how we lost our language, I guess. Um, not, not everything is uh, fully, fully known and some things are known, but only by like specific families or certain people that, uh, you know, somehow they were connected to it or their family was connected to that word in the past and it survives. Um, now there's a lot of things we don't have names for. Um, that's why we, we don't have it full of other plants as well. So I, I feel like if we had other names, I'm sure this, this garden would have a lot more than it already does. Um, but I like the diversity that it has in it. So uh, in front of that though, we have Little elderberries, they're doing much better now. This was uh, last year. Most of these, I think these pictures were all from last year. Um, I don't think I had any from the year before. Let me grab it, but not fully grown. And then as we go left off the screen, so this is where the, the red osher dogwood is. I know you can't really make it out in the picture, but there's sort of like a tier system. So if you're looking at the top canopy in the back, those are just like maples or birch or something. And then it comes down and the top is, uh, I think it's mostly willows and pussy willows things. And then just behind the raspberries up here in front is a row of uh, red oser dogwood that was just there. And the red oser dogwood, I will say is uh, another part of our Kniknik, our, our tobacco blend. And there's a lot of things that can go in uh, a Kniknik. Um, but the main ones really would be the bearberry, which also I think has the common name Kniknik, the red oser dogwood, and uh, probably tobacco or mullein something as like a filler. Usually, I think we would probably have used tobacco, but it, it wasn't always here. We didn't always have it. Um, we did grow it, um, but, you know, we, we tried to store things away, save as much as we can, but we, it's not something we always had. We had things when it was in season, and when we get it, when it was available. Um, so, the red oser dogwood, though, you wouldn't just take the leaves or anything. It's it's a little bit of a process. It, it 
we we use the bark of that one it's the inner bark but uh you have to roast it first and it has an interesting flavor it has it adds a whole nother aspect to it all um but we would use those blends in our our pipes for our ceremony and stuff um raspberries a great one um of course obviously it's great for women uh strengthens the uterus um but it's it's definitely one that we would have had throughout the early summer for you know berries and things and um what else is there there's blackberries next to that so here's another angle so you can see the raspberries there and then it transforms into maybe that's all raspberries there yeah and then it gets into the cherries so we have some just pin cherries and I think a couple black cherries, right? Or no, we had a black cherry, like there's a full size black cherry tree nearby. So we didn't end up planting any. So I think that's just pin cherries. Um, and then we have sort of this little center row that has a bunch of Canada lilies. So you can see the stalks right there. There's one right in the center. Um, and we've sowed some more seeds in there and planted a few more and I don't, I, I think I counted like 20 or something coming up throughout that bed this year. And they're looking great. Um, that is a, it has an edible tuber. Of course, if you harvest the tuber, because yeah, it, it'll kill it because it's a lily. Um, but that would have been one also with the sun chokes and the, the uh, ground nuts that we would have eaten probably not a lot of because I, I feel like we would have known that it kills them but i feel like they were also probably a lot more common um you know the diversity of things has come down quite a bit over the years uh, especially with all the, the monocropping going on in our forests or i don't know yeah around our forests because they're not creating new forests they're just creating a farm um, and then on this left side here, we have some uh, seaside sage right there. And then on the end, we just had some some mint. We just wanted to put some mint there just to give it some, some extra color. And then if we were to continue along the right side here, there's another little structure. So on the other side, we had the wild cucumber. On this side, we have the ground nut. And, Ground nut, we didn't have too many plants of. We, we planted a few of the, the tubers that come from it. And so you're starting to see a correlation maybe, but we have the sun chokes and we have the uh, ground nuts with tubers, Canada lily with tubers. Tubers were a very uh, hot commodity that we like to grow and um, help sustain us, right? Um, and then there is a pet. There, there's like a bunch of blackberries mixed in all around through there in front of that, but sort of off to the left of the the structure there, the little TP looking thing, there is a few black elderberries. So next to the wild cucumber, we have red elderberries, and next to the ground nut we have black elderberries and black elderberries are known to be edible the red elderberries not so much uh, i have read that you can prep prepare them in a certain way and the red elderberries can be used as well but we haven't tried it yet and i don't know if we will it's it's a lot easier just to use the black ones and uh I mean, they take preparation too, but I think they have less of the toxin that's in it um, that you have to cook out because that's part of the process. You gotta you gotta cook it for a while, sort of on a low simmer. Um, so I wonder, do I have a picture? Yeah, probably of it. Um, but <clears throat> so we have structure with ground nut, and then we have that. Uh, the elderberries and the blackberries and then there's sort of like a small patch of like really wetlandy sort of stuff uh what do we have there i think it was the uh 
Ilex, yeah, Alton Holly, and um, some huckleberries down below. So there's like a mix of different things in there. There's huckleberries. I think we have black and dwarf. We have the mountain holly and blueberries. And so, and then you can sort of see like above where this, the, the mint and the seaside sage are, we got the sweet grass. There's that big row of sweet grass and then the tobacco's on the other side. But then you see the big giant horns of mullein there next to the tobacco. So that was an alternative that we had. After uh, colonization, mullein arrived and we started actually substituting our tobacco because obviously we weren't, we weren't able to go out to our, our spots and check on our plants or, um, you know, go harvest anything really. So we had to find other things to use in our ceremonial pipes. And mullein was one of the things that came up with the Europeans. Um, and, you know, uh, it has very big woolly leaves and it's actually very reminiscent of tobacco. If you were to hold them side by side, one's just a little bit fuzzier and thicker. and uh, yeah, so we would use that, although it doesn't have nicotine in it. Uh, it wasn't always, like I said, tobacco mixes don't necessarily need to have tobacco. And even when we had it, we didn't always necessarily use it. Um, we we sometimes just flavor it with like strawberry leaf or something. And, you know, red osier dogwood and strawberry leaf is good enough. That's, that's a blend. Um, there's all kinds of those as well, though. Um, Let's see here. So there's a sort of a better, not really, it's kind of blown out. There's a lot of exposure stuff. I'm gonna fix these slides. Um, but you can see the uh, mountain holly there on the right. There's some smaller little shrubby ones in the front. Those are the huckleberries. This is a big patch of mint that's out of control. And then along this, we have some blueberries in there and some sweet fern and a little patch of strawberries. Now, there's a big sandy patch behind there, and that's full of blueberries now. And I think we have like a little row of crowberry, and maybe we might have put the dwarf huckleberry in there. This might just be black huckleberry on this side. So we have a little path that goes back and wraps around because we have some things planted in the wetland as well. Now. Um, Blueberries, of course, I mean, you can eat the berries. They're great antioxidants. They taste really good. Huckleberries are really tasty. Um, but some of the plants that we get from the wetlands and different areas like that, like we built a little tiny, it's a small bed. You'd have to come down and check it out to see the, the muskrat root that we planted. But there is a calamus, or acorus calamus. Or, yeah, is that the right one? There's Americana, no, it's, it's Acorus Americana, the, the native one. So that that's one of our sort of very special ones. That's a very special plant to us. It's, uh, it only grows in like sort of slow moving watery coves and stuff like long rivers. And, um, but we would use the root of that as a uh, your sore throat. I don't know, it has a lot of different uses, but if you start to feel that little tickle in your throat, just chew on a piece of that. Usually it goes away within a day or two. Um, you see some of the flagging markers there for, uh, I think those are trees we planted. So we had some, uh, we planted some more willows in the back, and then I think we planted a tamarack at one of those. Now we have a few trees over there. Say we put some white birch over there because that's one of the ones you know used for all kinds of different things. White birch is a multifaceted <laughs> tree that we use. Canoes, everyone knows, but we would make all kinds of containers and baskets and things out of that. Um, let's see what else is here. Sweet fern. That's another one that we would use. I'm not sure if we would. I, I can't remember if that was actually in a smoking blend that we would make, but 
think it is in a smudge blend. So we have so many aromatic plants around, right? Sweet fern is one of those. It has I think, a lot of pining in it. It has a very piney smell. And uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a really good one. That one was very hard to transplant, though. Um, took us two or three attempts, I think, for a good sizable patch of them to take. Well, the first year was kind of, it, it was too late in the season, I think, for them. They just took a long time to establish because of the Rudy, Rudy, their Rudy rhizomes. Uh, they're, they're very woody rhizomes, I guess. Um, yeah, so they were a little tough. Sumac was a little tough. That's another one. Oh, there's the, there's the tobacco again. So you can see we have actually two kinds of tobacco here. So we have this little tiny one down here. That one actually got planted later. That's why it's so much smaller. But the big ones are ones that we brought back from Ghana. So there's a few smaller ones around. And those were donated. So the Botanical Garden gets a lot of donations. Other, uh, other botanists and growers and things. There's the patch of sweet fern, strawberry, now blueberry back there. Have to update this a little. You can see some of the blueberry sort of in the back row. And our mint patch, there's sort of a big overview. And there are some other rare species in here. Um, so underneath the, the cedar, we have uh, some yellow lady slipper and some blood root, this little pine straw, or yeah, pine straw, pine, pine needle bed. We have some things out of place. Like we have a couple hobble bush right here. Yeah, viburnum, mooseberry. What's the uh, viburnum? And I think we had some Labrador tea on the corner here. So that was one of the things we actually had planted over. We ended up having to plant over next to the huckleberries, and it wasn't in the picture there. Um, was Labrador tea because this was out of what well, wasn't the right spot, but we didn't have the other site built yet or uh, weeded out yet. So we put it here for now. We have one on the other end, and they're still alive. They're just, it took them a while to bounce back. They didn't like it very much. So, Labrador tea on either end here. And then we have hobble bush, which does get berries, these berries. It's actually in flower right now. Um, very, very beautiful flowers. The one with the big petals on the outside, and then a bunch of little ones in the center. And then, uh, that is so there's two things here there's um a patch of wintergreen and then there's a patch of bearberry or the kniknik so kniknik is the other additive that we would have put into our smoking blend so we would use the leaf of that the bark of the red osher dogwood some kind of leafy sub material tobacco mullein uh Early Everlasting even, I've used that before as a, in our blends. Um, and if you continue, well, Wintergreen's got some uses. I'm not exactly sure right off the top of my head, other than the berries, of course. Um, but neither of those grow in Odell as far as I know. Maybe Wintergreen, I might have seen that somewhere, but uh, I don't think that's the right habitat. Um, then we have a few mayflowers here, and there's a pink lady slipper, I think, planted within that, and some gold thread, which is another one of our, one of the, the ones that we've sort of been able to keep, I guess, is one of our uh, plants that people know about in our communities. It's one of the common ones, so that one is uh, sort of, I think it has the same active compound as golden seal. It's an immune system booster. Um, and then there's also Pipsisawa, which is Prince's Pine, I think is another common name. I can't think of Latin right off the top of my head. 
Um, but that's another one that we would have used in our connect. I've never used it actually. I've never found like a sizable patch of it to justify harvesting. Um, and I do that with a lot of things. Like if I go out to uh, look for mushrooms, I'm not going out to harvest mushrooms necessarily. A lot of times I just go out and I take 200 pictures and I come home. Um, sometimes I'll harvest and donate some samples to the museum. Um, but yeah, so when I go out and forage for the intent of foraging, it's very, very specific and planned out. Um, fiddleheads are one that I generally don't ever go out and harvest because there's so many other people harvesting. There's no point in me going out there too and messing up the habitat even more. Um, yeah, so for our, one of our businesses, our body care product business, we do go out and harvest quite a few different things. And I do, we, we have some spots, but they're, they're local, like out near where my mom lives, out towards Stanley. We have some property out there as well that we go and harvest on. But we collect wild roses and all kinds of different tree tips and uh, red oyster dogwood. So another thing we do with those is we make dream catchers, do workshops, dream catcher workshops with those and uh, sort of talk a bit about that kind of stuff. Um, what else do we harvest? I'm trying to think. There's all kinds of things and it, it, it really depends on the time of year, right? And as soon as things start popping up though, there's things to harvest, like even colt's foot. Colt's foot is a, a great like sort of lung tonic. I think it's good for uh, like coughs and things. Um, so we, we've made tonics with elderberry and uh, colt's foot where you know, it's, it's just like a cold medicine essentially. You could add some like, I don't know, or sap to it maybe, or maple syrup. <laughs> um, give it some extra nutrients. So yeah, this is a little slideshow that I put together. This is our last slide. Um, this is all this year. The, the frames aren't really in line with each other, but I tried to stand in the same spot. You get to see about 30 days of growth between March 25th and two days ago. So, um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? I think that pretty much concludes what I have to say. I don't know. I probably have a lot more that I could say, but like just talking to, uh, I feel like I'm talking to nobody when nobody's talking. <laughs> I'm sure other people have shared that sentiment. <laughs> yeah, Anthony, so there are a few questions here. Yeah. Um, so the first one here is, do you harvest goldenrod before or after it flowers? Um, the person understands that dandelion greens need to be harvested before they bloom. So yes. they wonder about goldenrod. Same, same deal. So I harvest the greens, like the spring greens, just the tips of them before they, way before they flower. Yeah. And uh, for preparation, I think you just, we, we just blanch them once. And then uh, if you want to freeze it as like to store it, you can add a little more water, or like you know, just dump the water in like a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer. And we we store all kinds of food in the freezer like that. It's a great way. Okay, another question here. Um, how do you protect the plants in the medicine meal from animals eating them or people picking <laughs> them? Uh, we don't. <laughs> we, we've actually talked about uh, getting a couple cameras, like wildlife cameras maybe, but... Uh, I don't know. It doesn't, it wouldn't really solve anything. And we, we've thought about getting like, there's like these reflector things down, I guess, that you can like hang up in a tree and like prey will see it and see the reflection and think it's a predator. So they, they had talked about getting those, but we never did. Um, we have had quite a bit of trouble. That's another thing planted with the red elderberry actually was a high bush cranberry and deer love those. 
Um, I definitely have noticed that in the woods prior to me even dealing with it here, but it seems like every, every spring so far, they've come and bit all the tips off the, the high bush cranberry. And, and the last question I have here, uh, can willow be used as a tea? Yes, like for aspirin, like a pain reliever. I think that's what I hear a lot of people use it for. I, I don't really ever do that. I don't really ever take uh, ibuprofen or aspirin or anything, but like, yes, you can. I'm not sure on the dosage. I'm sure it's, it's not very much. It, it would probably be quite a small amount. It's... It's pretty concentrated, I think, for the most part. Okay, um, that is all I have here for questions. Uh, okay. So thank you, Anthony. Um, yes. I will pass it right over to Mary. Okay. Okay, thanks, Anthony, so much for that. Um, I do have another question. I'm just wondering, you obviously go out and harvest and you're very conscientious about um, how much you take. Do you have mm -hmm. a kind of a general guideline for people if they're going out to harvest things? Um, I know we shouldn't uh, decimate the whole population of whatever you're harvesting, but when you're giving talks and walks, do you generally give um, uh, guidelines to people for harvesting? We, we do. So that's, that's another thing we talk about a lot on our walks is like respecting the area and reciprocating our, uh, what we take essentially, like you can't just take something and not put something back. So a part of that though, I think is also the teaching of it. Right. And just to be conscientious of the plants and their existence because they're organisms too, right? They're, they're alive. They feel things. Um, and so I guess some of the guidelines we put in place is like, obviously if you see like a small patch of something or like only a couple of something, you don't take it. That's like our general rule of thumb. Wait until you find a bigger patch of it. Like, um, but if we do find a big patch, usually it's like, I'll take like every third or every, every fourth one or something. Like I always, leave, I try to just take a small percentage of it and it's, and it's usually just of the best looking ones. Like I'll leave all the ones that look subpar. Like if it's for harvesting berries, we'll just take that for instance. I'm not going to take the ones that are sort of already squishy. I'll leave those to fall on the ground and regenerate. And then I'll also leave probably half of the good looking ones because you, know, you never know. Um, but that's just one example. I mean, there's so many other things like rose petals. That, that doesn't really harm the plant too much when you take the rose petals. It, it's pretty much just a signal for the insects to come and pollinate, which a lot of the time they've already pollinated. But me taking the rose petals is pollinating in itself. Because every time I grab one and put it in my basket and grab the next, I'm pollinating each one. So I'm pollinating. I'm a pollinator. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that the, the whole topic of reciprocity is, is fascinating and is a huge topic on its own. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so I really want to thank you today. I mean, that's, it's, uh, you obviously are really knowledgeable about everything that you have put in this garden <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's really, I think, really beneficial to focus on, as you said, just focus on one small area at a time and try, instead of trying to cover everything. So I know you must have a million talks, but thank you so much for today's talk, Anthony. Thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate it. And so with that, then I also would uh, like to remind everyone to hang on a little while later so members can vote on the budget um, uh, that will be presented for the Hawk Watch, um, the Green Law Mountain Hawk Watch program. And just to remind you that this presentation wraps up our series of guest presentations for the season. And we'll begin again in September. So watch the website for details on guest speakers for next season. And uh, be sure to check Nature St. John website for upcoming out outings and register if you're required. 
And if you have any suggestions for future outings or guest speakers, uh, please email Julie Bauer and uh, you can find her email on the website. So with that,